And greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. We're brought to you by our friends. Yes, Aaron is still here. Baby has yet to arrive. I'm sure Bella is very patient uh, over the we, last few days, we correct? We are just brimming with anticipation, let's put it that way. That's, that's another way of saying it, indeed. That's the that's the right way of putting it, yes. Uh, we're brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, the Patriot-owned, sharing your values, flavor for every freedom-loving American coffee company. Get 10% off when you go to firstcup.com and use the promo code DACE. 10% off with the promo code DACE at firstcup.com. And if you subscribe, then you get an additional 10% off each month for the life of your subscription. You can't beat it. Aaron raves about it, and he thinks coffee's a food group. You can trust him. Firstcup.com. Use the promo code DACE. Also want to let you know, quick programming note. All three of us have had a chance to see this. Debuting tomorrow night right here on Blaze TV. In, in my opinion, I think this is the finest work that this network has done since we've been associated with it, which is what? October 2018 is when we did the merger, right? Our yep. show kind of launched yep. the merger. <laughs> so that's five and a half years. That's a long time. Um, and obviously we think this platform does some pretty good work. Yeah. That's why we're aligned with it, okay? This is, this is, I think, maybe the best work our platform's ever done. I, I think it's among the greatest works any platform in alternative, particularly right of center alternative media has ever done. You know, I mean, I, I kind of would put like in its own level, you know, God, man at Yale by, you know, Buckley, the way things ought to be by Rush. Um, maybe I'd put What's a Woman by Matt Walsh in there in terms of things that were tipping points or pivotal moments at, on, at, on certain levels. Um, and on certain issues that that altered the trajectory from a an ideological or worldview perspective, fair? Oh yeah, those are seminal works, and I, this is the closest thing to the in, the impact of what's a woman I have seen since what's a woman, and that was what twenty one. So now we're going back a few years, a few years now. Um, it's called bought and paid for. And it's uh, the latest Blaze Originals uh, that's going to debut tomorrow night exclusively on Blaze TV. Uh, if you have never been a subscriber to Blaze TV before, this is the moment. Okay. I mean, th- th- this is what um, what's going to happen here as they walk you through. And I mean, dollar, dollar amounts are named. Names are named. And... Here's what makes it next level. You know, I used to say, it's still true, the reason why the Babylon Bee was so hated is that it, it held to the same standard regardless. If, if it thought, even if it thought its fellow evangelicals were clownish or cartoonish, it would mock them. Mm-hmm. The, the, the willingness to apply the plumb line evenly is what made what makes the Babylon be so effective and dangerous. If if it was just going to do agitprop, satire, and parody for one side or the other, chances are that doesn't violate the rules of engagement. You're no, you're no threat. You're a threat when you're prophetic, when you're telling the truth and then holding to it regardless of the outcome. There are going to be names mentioned here, some of whom are very popular. I'm not going to spoil anything. Some of whom are very popular on the right, and they're going to get called out. And, and that was the moment, you know, like that Leonardo DiCaprio gif, I don't know what movie that is, where he's holding the... the uh, Sits up and points. The, the yeah. lung dart and the beer, yeah. and he points, hey, 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 hey that, that, I had that, I was watching this on my iPad in the basement two days ago. And and when and and when we we I was like wait we we went there we did that we did. I mean this is, am I am I overselling this? I thought you might be, but then I watched it and I said that's no. why I wanted you. That's why I want. I knew Mr. Vinegar would tell it, me if I was overselling. It should be, uh, quite frankly, for every single show on the Blaze. This is the new plumb line. I mean, if you're not at least trying to reach this level of out and out accountability uh and honesty uh, you're you're just not trying hard enough it's fantastic yeah, make sure you watch till the very end oh like yes the very very end 
I mean, the analogy George Santos draws here. It, it if just made my jaw drop. And if even he's that, even half true or a quarter correct. true. Yeah. Even that, nobody believes it. Like at home, wait, you're telling me George Santos is the crescendo of, yes. Just trust us on yeah, this. I know. If, George Santos is not pretending to be a saint no, in this. No, no, no. He, he, he's not. Okay. By any stretch. I mean, this is real, raw. I know we throw the word based around quite a bit. This is the new definition of based is this show. All right. In, in my opinion. I mean, this, this takes this now. This is now where you start making a cultural impact, in my view. Well, we have. We, uh, when you start really being a threat is when you hold up a plumb line, similar to what the Babylon Bee has done, and you hold everybody accountable to it. And this special does it masterfully. So there is a live premiere um, that is at 8 Eastern on Wednesday. It's a live pre-show event hosted by Glenn. Uh, and it's uh, followed by the live premiere of Bought and Paid For, How Politicians Get Filthy Rich, streaming live on YouTube TV and Blaze TV. Uh, you can go to youtube.com uh, slash at Blaze TV to watch the live event. And then subscribers can actually watch it, the whole thing on Blaze TV. So blaze tv.com slash days. Go there today. Become a subscriber. You do not want to miss this. I'm telling you. This isn't just entertaining. This isn't just informational. <clears throat> this is like service to the Republic level of content. It's phenomenal. Don't miss it. All right. Now that um, everybody's expectations are raised, I guess you're subjected to us for the next hour and 52 minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, coming up at the uh, bottom of the hour. I know we're really hard on the church on this show. Uh, I do have, there are uh, uh, pastors and there is a remnant around the country uh, trying to do what is right and uh, fulfill their commission. We'll talk to one of them, a longtime friend of the show, former NFL football player, uh, Pastor Paul Blair will join us at the bottom of the hour. Um, just to prove that we are idol making factories and our hearts can turn absolutely everything into idolatry. I now have to, I am being now compelled by what I have seen the last few days. Well, really the last 24 hours. Uh, we've now got to unpack federalism. That, that's become an idol. And I'm going to unpack that for you when idolatry or not next hour. If we have time, we may not. Because this is a, this is a very important conversation that is an excellent segue epilogue to everything we discussed for two hours and then the overtime yesterday okay if we have time for pop culture tuesday it's kind of snuck up on me because in some respects it feels like it was yesterday and then in other respects it feels like it was 10 years ago okay but this week is the one year anniversary of the release of nefarious so we'll discuss some of the uh some of the lessons learned through that experience and then what's next on that front uh, if we have time today for pop culture tuesday uh, coming up in the next hour of the program so with all that let's get to it here's aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away what happened while we were away brought to you by a rare dose of sanity the national association of intercollegiate athletics announced a policy this week that all but bans dudes from competing in women's sports at its 241 mostly small colleges across the country the naia council of presidents approved the policy in a 20 to nothing vote at its annual convention in kansas city missouri the naia which oversees some 83,000 athletes competing in more than 25 sports is believed to be the first college sports organization to take such a step according to the organization's new transgender participation policy which goes into effect in august all athletes may participate in naia sponsored male sports but only athletes whose biological sex assigned at birth is female and have not begun so-called hormone therapy will be allowed to participate in women's sports Meanwhile, in Alaska, Alaska, Democrat State Representative Andrew Gray, during a committee meeting on a bill that would ban dudes from competing in women's athletics, asked save women's sports advocate Riley Gaines a really dumb question. Do you have any studies that show that trans women have um, physical advantage over what I'm going to call cis girls, what you call biological girls um, in sports? Look, if we're looking at Leah Thomas again, uh, what I would say I have the most experience with, this was a male who went from ranking 554th nationally in one event to winning a national title the next year. Plus, just taking the time we've spent in this 
committee hearing today, we have only been referring to this whole debate, males infiltrating into women's sports. If, if the argument is that males don't possess advantages over females, then why haven't we spent any time talking about uh, or worrying about women entering men's sports? It's because everyone in this hearing room, this committee room, knows that that's not what we're referring to. Anyone with a brother knows the advantages that males possess over females. Uh, so I feel as if um, the evidence is evident. You look at any sport. Let's take the basketball, for example. Of course, we just watched the championship game yesterday. The three-point line is a different distance. The size of the ball is smaller. Uh, the amount of layups you see in women's basketball compared to dunks when a man or any player gets a fast break on that court. Um, men's volleyball, the, the net is seven and a half inches higher than the women's net. I could keep going with different advantages. Tee off in golf, uh, men's tee is further back than women's tees. All of these handicaps or advantages or categories what have you are in place for a reason and that because is because we have never struggled to understand that men of course on average are stronger faster taller more explosive can jump higher than women it's not sexist to say that it's not bigotry to say that it's biology back at the white house joe biden is taking a victory lap over his bucking of the supreme court and others over his administration's so-called forgiveness of student loans from day one my administration has been committed to fixing the broken student loan system and making sure higher education is a ticket to the middle class not a barrier my administration has approved debt cancellation for four million americans through various actions and today, I'm announcing new plans that would cancel student debt for millions more. A new survey from the American Enterprise Institute finds that Gen Z women are leaving the church at a higher rate than Gen Z men, flipping a generations-long trend. Boomer, Gen X, and millennial young men had been more likely to leave the faith of their youth than women, but now the share of Zoomers leaving the church is comprised of 54% women versus 46% men. The AAI survey found Gen Z men are only 11 points more religiously unaffiliated affiliated than baby boomer men, but the gap among women is almost two and a half times as large. 39% of Gen Z women are unaffiliated compared to only 14% of baby boomer women. A new op-ed at the Free Press details how one longtime employee of National Public Radio believes the media outlet has lost its way. In the piece, Yuri Berliner says he fits every single stereotype of an NPR employee. He says he was raised by a lesbian peace activist mother, drives a Subaru, and his podcast playlists are identical to those who attend UC Berkeley. Berliner, though, says NPR lost its way long ago when it decided to start telling its listeners how to think. Berliner says in the piece, quote, It's true NPR has always had a liberal bent, but during most of my tenure here, an open-minded, curious culture prevailed. We were nerdy, but not knee-jerk, activist, or scolding. In recent years, however, that's changed. Today, those who listen to NPR or read its coverage online see something different. The distilled worldview of a very small segment of the U.S. population, end quote. That full piece is interesting, and again, you can read it at the Free Press. And finally, it's time for an In This House We Believe Science is Real update. Here's Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Sometimes you've heard the word full moon Sometimes you need to take the opportunity just to come out and see a full moon is that complete rounded circle, which is made up mostly of gases. Allow me to proctologize myself. <laughs> Suppositorily speaking, my incarceration has forced, you said, the ventilation of, shall I say, my dairy air. And upon my discharge, I will evacuate, excuse me, ejecutate. <laughs> my mind to the prophylactic of the bowels of society and that's why the question the question is why or how could we as humans live on the moon are the gases such that we could do that the sun is a mighty powerful heat that is almost impossible to go near the sun and that's what happened while we were away <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't, when it, you consider the amount of knowledge available to us per capita, this could very well be the dumbest time ever to be alive. It, it's quite possible. Oh, I don't, 
it's more than possible. Aaron's Montage brought to you by our friends over at Patriot Mobile. For a decade now, they've been America's only American wireless service provider. And when we say only, we mean only. All right. So thankfully, one place where the parallel economy is fully available to all of us is with the one device we all need nowadays to thrive in modern American society. That's our mobile phone. So make the switch today with our friends over at Patriot Mobile. Uh, You can switch to any of their major networks inside of their network anytime you want for free or you need to. That's just one of the many things they do with their outstanding U.S.-based customer service team. If you're a veteran or first responder, let them know when you're going to make the switch. They have extra ways to say thank you for your service. All of us if you use my name steve as a promo code you'll get a free activation and qualify for that when you go to patriotmobile.com slash steve you can keep your phone upgrade your phone keep your number change your number they'll customize it for you patriotmobile.com slash steve again promo code steve at patriotmobile.com slash steve coming up in the overtime today we have a twitter poll going that just completed asking the question should is there ever a reason for a pastor to own a 16,000 square feet home ever we have those results and we will discuss them later today in the overtime for blaze tv subscribers at blaze tv.com slash dace and i'll get into why i even chose that random question yeah i have no idea out of the blue all right blaze tv.com slash dace okay um I'm going to start in Aaron's montage in a place maybe you weren't expecting, but then again, maybe you were. Okay. I want to start with the NPR employee. Here's why. I got an email the other day and I, and I get one of these emails sadly all too often. We often discuss the culture war as um, as a theory, as an aesthetic. Um, but for many of us, and for many of you, I should say, it is sadly practical, meaning you've you've seen it come home to your own families. You've seen it infest your own families. And so I get a, a letter from a sweet grandmother, and I have gotten this kind of a note. I can't tell you how many times. Uh, My adult child has walked away from the faith. Um, Usually it's to enter into some form of immoral relationship. In this case, uh, her daughter is convinced that she should be married to another woman. And this has confused her grandson, who was very strong uh, in the faith when he was younger, and they talked about it frequently. And now he is confused because... um, It's not that he doesn't know what the scriptures say about homosexuality. The confusion comes from the fact that he does. And does that mean my mother, you know, is damned? And how do I reconcile with that? And I don't want to be against my mom, even though my conscience is telling me she's wrong, but my heart says otherwise. If only there was like an institution somewhere that God would have given us that would have helped us walk through such situations. And can't believe he didn't think of that. Anyway, um... This is a familiar story. You, in fact, you could argue that it's really, pardon the pun, at the genesis of the unraveling of Western civilization from the outset. I mean, Darwin openly admitted that one of the driving forces in his, um, his seeking uh, you know, alternative theories about the origins of species... And much of what he uh, was inspired by was from a brand new science known as geology from a book that's largely been discredited by modern geologists. Okay, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, Anyway, he openly admitted, Darwin did, that he was partially driven by what he called, and I'm quoting here, the damnable doctrine. Well, I've got all these family members who aren't Christians, rebelled against the Church of England. Um, they're secular, um, uh, socialist, which was become, you know, which, uh, they, we, he, this was all at the, the advent of this. I mean, Marx was heavily inspired by Darwin. You probably don't get Marx without Darwin. And, and the book that really 
uh, takes Darwinism to its to its own dialectic is the follow up, the descent of man. I mean, Darwin understood in Origin of Species, he's begging questions that now require answers. In other words, let me see if you can follow here. Going back to the NPR guy, you started off just asking questions and you know being open minded, and then ended up writing a book where he decided he was empowered to provide the answers. That's what Descent of Man is. The Descent of Man is a worldview met- framework. It, it's where Darwin lays out now what essentially is should be your worldview in light of the scientific, uh, in, quote-unquote, inquiry he inspired. Almost as if he either never intended to be just asking questions and open-minded, mm-hmm. or, or maybe once he realized that he was like, well, we got to have some alternative answers if we don't like the answers we have, right? Origin of species is love is love. Yes. Descent of man is guys in women's bathrooms. Yes, exactly. Connect the dots. And, and explains why you should bake the cake bigger. Yeah, exactly. And why you should be punished uh, for your own good, of course. This is the exact pattern that this former NPR employee is laying out. And for every one of any of these kinds of guys or a Bill Maher or, you know, frankly, I think you could put Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in this group, although I think intellectually he's well ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for all of these guys who really thought that this that that we were creating, you know, some Timothy Leary inspired um, search for meaning and purpose. In, in inwardly via the, our open-mindedness that Aldous Huxley was Ezekiel. For all the people that actually believe this, understand there's 10,000 who, who get that that was all BS from the beginning. That, that, that was just all a means to an end. That was just all a means to deconstruct the, the current ethos to replace it with another one. Which is what you and I were suspecting and pointing out when you and I both worked in the Des Moines Register Correct. newsroom back then. We had conversations with colleagues. We worked in this place with this guy and talked with him. So this is how we go from, you know, our former employer. But this is how I go from being able to work there. Exactly. Being And then after I leave to get into broadcasting, still being friends with many people there. Being given, offered a job to be one of their lead columnists. To when I submit my first column, they act like they never offered me the job, even though they promoted it on the front page of the newspaper. It's all happened. Okay. Then they acted as if it would never happen and I didn't exist and, and tried to, and then, and told me that, uh, uh, they needed money for high school football stringers, which is ironic because that was one of the gigs I originally started out doing at the Des Moines Register in the 20th century. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, this is, this is the, it's, it's it, I, same thing. Okay, Um, I'm allowed on MSNBC as a token to be made fun of. Then they find out that I'm intellectually serious. And so you may actually add something to our programming, but we're going to gang up on you every chance we can. If you can take us down four on one, good for you. And I more than held my own, frankly. Thank you very much. Which is why then it went to they won't even call me now. L.A. Times used to call me for quotes all the time. They called me for the first time yesterday in like five years. Probably because they saw I was critical of what Trump uh, said about abortion yesterday. Did I call them back, do you think? No. No. Why? Well, because I've seen Batman Begins. I'm Jim Gordon in Batman Begins. I'm not a rat. Not going to help you. Yeah, I mean, I'm very disappointed with what's happened with the GCPD. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got problems right here in River City. Right? Very disappointed. With what with with what's become of the authority of here in Gotham City, very not not this is not what I thought I was signing up for when I joined this police force, right? Okay, um, and I'm going to conscientiously object to the grift and everything else that's going on within the GCPD, right? But I'm not going to rat out my own unit to these people, no, because there's no one to really rat to, right? See when I see my point? Yeah. That's what Jim Gordon says in the movie. There's no one to rat to anyway. No, no, I'm not going to partake of this grift, but I'm not a rat. There's no one to rat to anyway. 
right? So uh, is the LA Times interested in a true dialectic about uh, abortion? That's adorable. No, they just want to use me as a cudgel to club Trump in an election year, and I'm not going to give it to them. So I didn't even return the call. Because there once was a moment when they were willing to be open-minded. They had their own viewpoints, but they were at least willing to give us an audience. Now, that moment has passed. They wanted to beat you in an argument early on. Now they know they can't. Yes. And so we started out four legs good, two legs bad. We ended up four legs are good, but two legs are even better. Yes. We started out animals should not harm other animals. We ended up with, and they looked from pig to man and man to pig and back to pig again, and they couldn't tell which was which. This was inevitable. And those are the words you just quoted were from a man from of the left. Yes. George Orwell, in his time, yes. was a man of the left. Yes. See, this is, this is where we can't outrun a biblical worldview. We can't outrun the old magic. We think we can. We can boom any sound of anything we want in our ears any time we want. It, it used to be that you had to be an extremely wealthy man to be able to see multi, multiple naked women in your lifetime. Now... You have, to, you have to avoid, no matter what financial uh, socioeconomic class you're in, you have to avoid not seeing multiple naked women in a day, okay? Nevertheless, despite all these quote-unquote advances, and we'll talk more about this next hour too, the laws of nature and nature's God remain. You may have all the degrees and letters after your name. You may have all the worldly acclaim. But this isn't your world. It's our Father's world. He made it. And it's His footstool. So, something must rule. Something is always going to rule. Something must reign. Something was always going to reign. From the first time someone showed up and said, I'm just asking questions here, the serpent in the garden, until the most recent time, 30 seconds ago, Everyone who's ever done this, ever, either did so with the intent of deconstructing the agreed upon truth for the purposes of introducing a new one, or they will eventually end up in that place. There are no neutral spaces, and there never have been. Light will rule or dark. Dark will rule or light. Syncretism, multiculturalism, all these other isms of plurality beyond a shared identity are all lies and impossible. Something will rule. The, the, the liberals, the real liberals, like the few, the proud, like this guy from NPR, they're not smart. Bill Maher's not smart. They're fools. Because they actually believed that this was some kind of road to self-actualization. And it never was. I mean, Lennon once wrote a song at the end of the Beatles' tenure called Revolution. What is the song about? He's actually mocking the left in the song. What, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, Vietnam's bad, but you want me to sign up, sign up with Mao Zedong, who's killing more people than LBJ did at the Gulf of Tonkin? I, I thought we were actually peaceniks here, all right? But, but, but again, he's not smart either, because just a few years after he wrote and did that song, he wrote another song called Imagine, which is the actual origin of everything he wrote in Revolution that he claimed he was against. Imagine there's no God, so there's no authority. Something must rule. Mao says, I will. Stalin says, I will. NPR says, we will. Something is going to rule. Someone is going to rule. It won't be us. Everything's a battle of dominion. Either creator, God is in charge, or the enemy is. And there's not a middle ground. There never has been, there never will be. Period.
Abortion has been the greatest sin in our history as a country, and it still happens every single day, sadly. Unfortunately, overturning Roe was only the first step in a long list of steps towards eventually cleansing our country of this horrible stain on our collective soul. That's why the Ministry of Preborn exists. That's why we partner with them here at The Blaze. They empower young, unexpected unexpected mothers uh, in crisis like my mom was. She wasn't looking to have a kid at 15. Uh, they empower these mothers to choose life. Preborn has rescued with their methods of grace and truth. Funny, they just kind of follow the greatest evangelist that ever lived, uh, the guy, the, 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 the spirit that wrote the scriptures. Uh, they just follow grace and truth. They confront moms with the truth. Hey, that, that's another being. It's another person that you are carrying there. Here's its heartbeat. You don't have two hearts, so one of them doesn't belong to you. You, you can't kill that. It's not some unviable tissue mass. But then with that conviction, they also bring grace. So they're there for those moms, both before and after the baby is born as well. They love them both. And that's why they've been so successful. They have saved hundreds of thousands of babies over the years, uh, up tens of thousands, just since we started partnering with them here at The Blaze. If you want to commit to helping save lives, it's now a soul-to-soul, hand-to-hand combat now in the post row world. Um, you can dial uh, to donate tax-free, deductible. Dial pound 250, say the keyword baby on your mobile phone, or just do what our family does when we give. Go to preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. So let me finish this point that I was making about the NPR NPR guy in Aaron's montage, because it'll segue great to our guest. Okay. So I want to bring this back to the grandmother I mentioned, because I've gotten this note a lot. Hey, my adult child walked away from the faith. Um, I'm trying to stop and help my grandchild to not follow in their footsteps. What do I do? Okay. And this, but this grandmother asked me for sources of information that would, that would convince her grandson not um, to, to, to follow in his mother's heresy. Here's, here's a paraphrase of what I wrote back to her. There is no source of information. There, there is no objective piece of data that you and I could present that would overcome the emotional pull of, well, you know, my mom has fallen into homosexuality. I know what the scriptures say about that, but I, I just can't, I don't, I don't want to believe that my mom would, would, you know, be punished for her sin. And so I, you know, I, I can't rely on the grace of God to change people's hearts and minds and lives. Um, and, um, uh, and so I'll just change either the scriptures or I'll just create my own. That information won't overcome that. And take that from a guy who's as data driven as any show in this entire industry is, but information won't change that. Conviction does. And that doesn't come from us. That comes from the spirit that comes from the word of God. I mean, ultimately each of us will make a choice. You'll choose this Tuesday, this day whom you will serve. One or the other. And there isn't a middle ground. In this country, because of our comfort and collective wealth, we have been able longer than maybe any other civilization, because they've all tried it too, by the way. But we've been permitted to try it longer than maybe anybody else ever has in the history of this planet to pretend otherwise, that there is a middle ground. There's not. That NPR guy is figuring that out. And he'll eventually have a choice. The dog will return to its own vomit. He'll go back in a line with his NPR people or he'll turn to God because there's not an in-between. You end up where Bill Maher is at where you explain all the reasons why Gavin Newsom would be a terrible president and then turn around and say, but you know, he'd be a great president because in the end, Bill Maher wants to smoke pot in his lounge. That's his God, what he wants to do. And so, you know, he's, he'll submit to the God he made, he forged in his own conscience with his own hands. One or the other. There are tough times ahead. We are learning and are going to learn more vividly what Jesus meant when he said, do not think I came to bring peace, but a sword. Members of a man's own household will be turned against him. This is here now. So where do we turn? How do we learn? How we, whom would disciple us, guide us? Unfortunately, the, the collective state of the American church is why we are here, mostly. But there is always a remnant. Let's talk to a friend of mine who's a part of that. Pastor Paul Blair joins us again here on the show. It's good to see you again, brother. How are you? 
Hey, great, Steve. It's good to see you. Thanks so much for having me on today. You bet. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And one of the things that you've got a heart for is pastoring pastors. That's part of the initiative that you're a part of. You've been on and told us about it before, but to remind us, what is it that you do? Well, of course, I am a pastor, and uh, so I don't make a living doing our Liberty Pastor training camps, but I'm passionate about the uh, spiritual uh, depravity of our country. I want to see a great awakening. You know, we are either in for a uh, great awakening or a great reset, and our pastors are finally starting to awaken to that to some degree. So uh, although I am a pastor, our pastor's camps are basically a situation where we are discipling those that are supposed to be the disciple makers. You know, that is our great commission, not to go and make church members, not to go build a big church. Our, our uh, commission is to go and make disciples. And what that word means is Christ followers, followers of Jesus. And all we've done in America is we've made great churches and great church members. We've got great Sunday morning Christians, but they've compartmentalized the rest of their life from Christianity. In fact, we we basically hold to a form of Greek Gnosticism mm -hmm. where we have our material lives, which is off limits in church. And then we have a very, very tiny box that's called spiritual issues, and that continues to get shrink daily as more and more spiritual issues become political. And uh, there's a vast amount of information that pastors are totally um, clueless on, and consequently their, their congregations are. You, know, you were talking about worldview. Uh, George Barnum did a poll back in 2001 where he interviewed a bunch of conservative pastors and, and didn't just interview them, he actually tested them. And based upon the test results, found that 37% of pastors had a biblical worldview. Almost two-thirds of conservative pastors don't have a biblical worldview. Now, how on earth can we be making disciples if those that are charged with making the disciples don't have a biblical worldview? So that's what we're all about with our Liberty Pastors Camp. We bring these guys in for three days. We heavily subsidize it. Uh, and, and charge them only 99 bucks, about a $1,500 getaway for them and their spouses, their wives. And uh, over the three days of R&R &R and fellowship, we require that they uh, go through 20 hours of continuing education. Of course, uh, David Barton is one of our speakers this year. We have Bill Fetter, Bob McEwen. Uh, we, we've got um, yeah, Kevin Freeman from your network there mm -hmm. at The Blaze. We teach these pastors what the Bible has to say about the proper role and the limitation of civil government, and that resistance to perverse government is, in fact, biblical. And then we also teach them what the Bible has to say about economics. You know, there's all sorts of, uh, there's so much more we need to cover with these guys, apologetics, biblical sexuality, all sorts of topics, but we start with those two, and we've had remarkable success with pastors. They've admitted to coming to the camp only because of the heavily subsidized vacation. But those guys have come up to me afterwards and said, you have transformed my ministry. I, I only came here just for the free trip or for the cheap trip. But after hearing all this, I know it's right. You've opened my eyes. Literally had guys say, you've removed the scales from my eyes. So now we are approaching 2,000 pastors. We've got graduates from, from California to Florida, from, from New York State uh, down to Texas and all points in between that have attended our camps. Our 19th camp, uh, begins uh, in May, May the 6th through 9th. We're going to be in a battleground state, which is not a coincidence. That is by design. We're going to be in Milwaukee, beautiful Renaissance Hotel in Milwaukee, and uh, three days from May the 6th through May the 9th, only 99 bucks. Pastors can go to our website, libertypastors.com or libertypastors.org to get information and to sign up. And quite frankly, Steve, as I say, we, we've got this one coming up in Milwaukee. We plan to be in Arizona in June. If you can fit us into your scheduling time, I'd love to have you come and speak to these pastors. You, you fit in with what we're doing just perfectly. I'd love to do it. My wife handles that stuff for me. Let's see if we can make it work. I want to make sure if it, it's just 99 bucks. I mean, I, I know we're in the Let's Go Brandon economy, but I got to believe there's a lot of people in this audience, a lot of pastors that can afford 99 bucks. So again, where do they go, Paul, to sign up? And the next one is in uh, Milwaukee in May, right? Give the dates one more time. May the 6th through May the 9th in Milwaukee at the Renaissance Hotel. If you've never been to Renaissance, beautiful hotel, part of the uh, Bon Boy Network, just gorgeous place. Apparently a trendy area, some nice restaurants and shopping there very nearby. But go to our website, libertypastors.org and or libertypastors.com. We have both domain names and they can get all the information there and sign up there and register online. 
Uh, again, we've got, you know, of course, we're partnered with Patriot Mobile as well. We've got a, a group called My Church Finder, a businessman that runs car dealerships in, in Texas that's also passionate about awakening churches. Um, Art Alley from, from the Timothy Plan is one of our, our primary supporters, and, it, and it's their generosity and recognizing how important it is for us to have a change of our thinking if we're going to get a change in behavior. Uh, so these gentlemen are, are incredibly generous. Of course, our church also helps support this. And, and like I said, I don't make money in this. In fact, our, this, our church pays, helps pay to do these things. We consider this mission effort because, as you said, I think 2024 is, is going to be a very um, interesting year. Uh, I don't expect us to endure a, a normal election, uh, quite frankly, if if it if this is such a large margin that satan's party cannot steal it i expect us to be in world war three or some sort of false flag there will be something that that stirs the pot but but trust me you know i, I was watching you on election night as a matter of fact you were you were working with glenn on election night back in 2020 mm -hmm. and we were all smiling and the vote count in pennsylvania was fantastic and florida had already been called almost right out of the box then all of a sudden i saw the look on your face when you read a report about some sort of a plumbing problem in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we see the vote count stopped in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Arizona because of a plumbing problem in, in Atlanta. Tell you what, somebody better get some more fiber in their diet. They got a real problem with their sewer <laughs> system there if that caused the vote across the country to stop. So you know, anybody that has any ability to critical think and wants to be honest and objective realizes that what we saw in 2020 was an abnormality, and I just pray that we don't see it again. So we, we go to a church now where uh, our pastor openly admits he was a coward, and, and COVID basically woke him up at to the links by which the spirit of the age had, had made its way into the culture and then just doing normal happy church in the suburbs that he was accustomed to. Now the government's telling him he's got to shut down. And it's the guy he actually voted for telling him that. Okay. So let alone what the other guys will do. So that kind of was his wake up moment. All right. You know, that was kind of his wake up moment that, okay, you know, when I was a child, I thought spoken reason as a child when I became a man. And this is the moment now for men, it's time to set aside childish things. And so if, if you are one of those pastors and, and, but you're like, what do I do next? Cause this can, this can upheaval your ministry. I, I spoke at a Calvary Chapel church in Chattanooga two summers ago, great church. And if the pastor had not told me their story, pastor Frank had not told me their story, Paul, I would not have known it because the church is growing. It's vibrant. It's connected to the community. It's unified. But he told me that he also had a similar awakening the last few years and it bottomed out his church. I mean, like, are we going to stay open? Okay. But then what happened is they ended up replacing all the people that left and more with folks who were starving for truth and were driving from all over the state of Tennessee just to come to their little Calvary Chapel church there in Chattanooga on a Sunday because they also recognized the signs of the times. So this can be, we're not, we're not going to tell you, it's like I always say about my mom, it's great that she chose life, raising me at 15, that's not an easy life for anybody. Let's not romanticize that. It's very hard. OK, we, what we're asking you guys to do as pastors, it will cause upheaval. It will be difficult. All right. And so how do you manage that? So if you're awake and you're like, I don't know what to do or how do I do it better? What Paul wants to do here, first of all, is bless you and your wife. That's why we're doing this first class. And, and he's charging the minimal amount it would take to cover their costs. They want to be a blessing to you so that you then will get equipped and be a blessing to others. This this will be a process. Don't let's not romanticize it and just, hey, thanks for making the teaching harder. You know, there's not going to be a line of people that you drew with all that, with all of those carrots. And now suddenly you want to give them the stick. They're not going to say many of them. Thank you for that. They thought the carrots were going to go on forever. Right. So we need to make sure that these pastors that want to do this. They understand the transition that's a part of it and equip them and bless them for that. So, Paul, one more time, it's libertypastors.org or libertypastors.com if they want to take part in any of your conferences. And the next one is yep. coming up in May in Milwaukee, right? May 6th through 9th. These guys going to attend. There's no obligation. At the end of the camp, if they want to carry on with us, they are welcome. They can sign up then. If they don't, they can go home. I, I, we're batting almost a thousand. Just about everybody that comes after hearing the information is convinced and they know it's right. And then we just don't turn them loose. We walk with them from here on out. 
Uh, we give them a volume of materials that they can reference. We give them sermons, sermon notes, PowerPoints. Every speaker that they hear at the camp, they have access to the PDFs of their of their presentations. All of it's available to them online. They can incorporate into their own preaching. We have simple next steps that we recommend they do as a church. One of the things that we recommend that all our churches do is, is uh, partner with a local homeschool co-op. Mm-hmm. If not, start a private Christian school of your own. We have four different homeschools that operate out of our modest-sized church in Oklahoma. We're not a mega church. We're a healthy church, but we're not a, a, a super mega church. But we have four different homeschool co-ops and hundreds of children that have been able to dodge the LGBT grooming in the public education and get quality education for their own children and for those in their community. So we've got a lot of great information, then next steps. So we, we've we seen radical transformations with pastors across the country. It's so exciting because all of them are so different, so organic, but we see these guys literally come alive. So we invite anybody in your listening audience, send your pastor, inform your pastor. We limit it to 100 slots at each camp. We don't want it to be gigantic. We want to develop relationships with these guys because we intend to have a permanent relationship with them. That's a great idea. Bless your pastor so that uh, they can go as well. And it's just 99 bucks. All right. So libertypastor.com, libertypastor.org. It's always great to see you, Paul. God bless you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. God bless you. Thank you. you. All right, gentlemen, we got about a minute here left in the hour. Thoughts? He's absolutely right about what modern Christianity has turned us into. We're Gnostics, and we come to this very much just punch the clock for once a week self-help. Well, if you if it's just about you, you're not going to want to suffer. The self doesn't want to suffer. But if it is fundamentally about God and that relationship— you will want to suffer because there's no greater love than this, the one who will lay down his life for his friend. And the Lord, absolutely, that relationship is as deep a friendship that we can ever hope for based on what he has already given for us. We are, I believe, rightfully uh, critical and hard on pastors of this country on our show. And while much of it is probably deserved, there are a number, I, I have to believe, pastors out there. You know, just to say that, I would not want to be a pastor to go walk into a, a, a sanctuary every Sunday morning and know what all of the sins my congregation is dealing with. But we ask, where are the pastors with the heart for their congregation, that, that the, the real true heart for their congregation? Where are the people, though, with the heart for pastors? And I'm glad that Paul is is making himself available and stepping up to uh, to bat for them, because uh, that's that's just as important and critical as a, of a mission as what actual pastors have as well. Amen. Hour two is next. All right, back here with Hour 2 here on Blaze TV Radio and Podcast. I am Steve Dace, he's Todd Erzin, he's Aaron McIntyre. And you are you and can let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Take advantage of that by emailing the show, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you listen to the podcast, please, if you wouldn't mind, leave us a five-star review. And thank you to those of you that have done that. Thousands of you have. Thank you for each and every one. Also, uh, hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, that would be follow. And that way, every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your podcast feed every single time. So thank you to all of you that have done that, too. And fittingly, perfect timing. Thank you to our friends at Nehemiah Institute for sponsoring this portion of the show, because it is certainly right in their wheelhouse. Uh, Nehemiah Institute was founded in 1986. Um, I believe, Aaron, you have a, uh, a plaque there over your shoulder from Oh, that? do I? I oh, I think that's right. Yeah, that is. It's still there. <laughs> now, don't let the fact that they think highly of Aaron deter you from the overall credibility of the organization. I mean, everybody, you know, uh, politics makes for strange bedfellows. We all have blind spots. Every relationship, every family has its cousin, Eddie. Uh, but it, it, it's uh, adoration for Aaron notwithstanding. It's a very credible organization. <laughs> <laughs> right. That being said, Aaron, 
when you go on paternity leave, you might want to take that thing with you. We wouldn't want anything to happen to it. That while is you're the gone. first thing his new child will see. <laughs> hey, your dad got 100%. Yes. <laughs> is um, that a threat? Have you been reading to your child in the womb? The and, very- and, and it's been the, it's been with the plaque. It's yes. been that plaque. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, they created something called uh, the Pierce Test. All right. And it stands for politics, economics, education, religion, and social issues to test the worldview of Christian schooled children and Christian educators since the 80s. And let's just say the results are not inspiring. Fair. <laughs> uh, they want to do something about that. All right. But it starts with this test to find out where you truly are. And unfortunately, 90% of Christian youth score in secular humanism and only 3% score where, where Aaron is on the test in biblical theism. All right. So this is where the test comes in. If you want to see where you're at or where your kid is at, your grandkid is at, uh, where your church is at. If you really want to get depressed, you can see where your pastor is at. Um, here's what you need to do. Go to worldviewcheckup.org worldviewcheckup.org the test is just $17.76 per person see what they did there it's pretty cheap but they'll they'll throw in a 10% discount if you use the promo code SD my initials SD101 if you use the promo code SD101 you can take 10% off the 1776 and the results are instant they'll tell you instantaneously where you stand you can also read their position papers so you can read the hermeneutics that they go through to come up with I mean there are theologians from across the spectrum of Christian orthodoxy that consult on this test and they update it every few years to keep it current, fresh, etc. All right, so go to worldviewcheckup.org to take this test. Worldviewcheckup.org, worldviewcheckup.org. Use the promo code SD101 for the discount. And with that, let us embark upon idolatry or not. And I guess we were destined to end up here. You know, over the years, I've done trying to think how many times have we done have we done the 5,000 year leap book study since you guys have been here yes oh yes okay then it's at least three times in my career I have I have taken the audience through the 5,000 year leap book study which is a great um, apologetic on essentially the worldview of America how it was founded and why and what um, what traditions uh, and philosophies inspired it. And of course, it wasn't singularly inspired by Christianity, but it was it, nothing inspired it more than Christianity either. But we're in an era now where we, we are so far gone, kind of talking myself into doing the 5,000 year leap study again <laughs> um, for a fourth time. We, we are so far gone now though you know, I've noticed, I have noted in the past that we've taken the term Puritan and turned it into a pejorative, mm-hmm. right? Like it's, a, like it's bad to be puritanical. Like, as I pointed out when, you know, when I wrote the first children's book, Why Thanksgiving, the Puritans founded America. They founded the country. They, they landed at Plymouth Rock. They forged the first governing document in the history of this nation, the Mayflower Compact, the Puritans did. And and now we kind of use them as a put down. It's almost like a, a swear word to be considered puritanical. Um, you do that when you have transitioned, or maybe a better term is devolved, mm. although transition you nailed it. Yeah, maybe fits better for the day and age we're in. When when you have transitioned or devolved from ignorance to ingrate. That's from, a great from ignorance to ingrate. So so it. so I'm unaware. Of, of that what I'm commenting on and and now I'm anathema to it resent it spit on yes, it yes correct yeah and we're in ingrate territory now and when we are in ingrate territory we can take even good things and righteous things and make them idols we can desecrate them we will do so purposefully that is what you see the spirit of the age do is, you know, uh, Todd coined a phrase that I have borrowed many times the last few years, stained glass window smashers. 
Uh, these these are they're, these are people that are looking to smash stained glass windows. They they're out to do it. It's not it's an intentional act, as you like to say. The lie is the point. Yes, right? they're out to do this. It's on purpose, or we can do it unintentionally. And I I see this a lot on our side, where there is a, a hearkening to and a referencing of legacies and traditions, but we don't really know where, where they're from, so we misappropriate them. So we don't we don't desecrate them. What we do is diminish them. They've they've we've we've robbed them of their power in order to fit into our narrative. Feeling good, comfort Correct. instead of any level of sacrifice, lives, fortune, sacred honor kind of stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In, in other words, the things that that we prioritize rather than the things that are transcendent that we should be prioritizing. Right. Yes. Exactly. I have seen this now for the last, it's been about, what, uh, 36 hours since Trump's uh, statement on the abortion issue. And over the last 36 hours, I have seen, and you asked me about this on the show yesterday. So, I mean, by the time I composed my response to Trump's video, and then I got to get my workout in and get ready for the show, I'd not seen a lot of the responses and stuff to it. And so when, when, when you came at me on the show yesterday, well, isn't this just federalism, Steve? I thought... That is so dumb. Yeah, are people making this argument? Yes, they are. You've seen and it. Then yeah. I, and then after the show, I realized why you did that. Because I saw there were, yeah. there were and again, a lot of people making this argument. Really smart people, people that have been on the show, people we do respect. I know. I know. I know. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to unpack this. Okay. And, and try to get us back on the narrow road of what these things actually mean here because when you're when you're in a late stage republic when you're when you're you're doing the shenanigans uh of late republic nonsense hat tip dave reboy when we're in the midst of that kind of an era we will we will diminish and desecrate things that are that are were established and done to forbid us from doing the things that we're doing and we will diminish them and or desecrate them and then say we are doing the things of them. No, you undid them. You undid them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out the true framework of federalism. And then after I do, Todd and Aaron, the floor is yours. And I would like you guys to now take, once we lay this out, practically, let's, you guys come up with some questions, situations. Well, then, you know. How would we, how would we integrate that in apl- applicably? Fair. Mm-hmm. But first, we got to start with the teaching of what it is. So let's start with the beginning. I like to, you know, people always ask me, where do we should we start? I'm I'm a big believer in starting at the beginning. Why do you think life starts at conception? Well, it couldn't possibly start any earlier than that, <laughs> right? So. That's when it starts. They're on your curveballs, <laughs> yeah. Steve. Yeah. I kind of think we start things where they started. That's just a general thought I have philosophically. We, we begin where it begins. All right. So let's begin with the Declaration of Independence. The U.S. Code, that is the summation of all the laws of these United States of America. The U.S. Code refers to the Declaration of Independence as, quote, organic law the organic law of the United States doesn't say it's the only organic law. It lists, for example, the Northwest ordinance, the articles of confederation. Okay. But it, but it says it's the organic law of the United States. Now, what does that mean? It means, and it's a set an essential foundation since organic means derived from or sourced from that's what it means. Thus, in this case, What organic law means is that all of our understanding of law in the United States, all, 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 all of our understanding of law in the United States is to be derived or sourced from the Declaration of Independence as if it were a mission statement, which is exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. The the mission statement of America, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among them are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That is literally the mission statement of America right there. That's the whole rubric, the whole thing right there. 
One could even argue it was the original foundation. Maybe we could use the phrase cornerstone, if you will. Since it's the founding document of the country, nothing could have preceded it. Was there an America before July 4th, 1776? No. No such country existed. It declared itself on July 4th, 1776. It declared itself with what? What did it declare itself with? The Declaration of Independence. So again, where did something begin? At the beginning. At the beginning. What's the beginning? July 4th, 1776. Save me your email. Steve, they actually ratified it. I know. Stop. <laughs> Don't do that. I know. I know there's at least 300 of you that were typing that as we speak. I know. Just stop. Okay. We, we got it. Thanks. I will say other things in, that you'll need to correct. That won't be one of them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Declaration tells you what it's based on. It tells you it is predicated upon, quote, the laws of nature and nature's God. And it, it does so as the supreme revelation of law upon the earth. The case that is then made is that revolt against the king of England is justified morally and lawfully on the grounds that he is in gross violation of the laws of nature and nature's God through what the declaration describes as, quote, a long train of abuses. I know these weren't trite things. We, we, took, we did everything we could. We tried to negotiate. These things went on for years. And, and ultimately, these injustices would, it would not stop leaving us no other recourse to continue to live as the King of England wants us to live, the founders make the case would put us in disobedience to God. And we have to obey God over man. That's the case that is being made here. The founders then itemize these abuses specifically. And at the end... They, of, of, of the itemization of these abuses, they appeal to the same God who has revealed his natural law to humanity that they claim to be upholding to act as, quote, and I'm quoting from the declaration, the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. In other words, they are saying that if we have wrongly interpreted and applied your revelation in declaring this revolt, judge us accordingly instead of the king. Judge us instead. They're not claiming to be better than the king of England, like a better class of person. They're claiming to be a more obedient one. That's a very important yes, distinction. Is. Let me say that again. They're not claiming to be a better class of person than King George III. They're claiming to be an obedient one. We want to live... Creator God, by your revealed precepts, the king does not. This isn't shirts versus skins. It's right versus wrong. Correct. And if we're in the wrong, or if the long train of abuses that we have itemized do not measure up to war, because they understood that that's what this doctrine of succession meant, secession, I should say. This was a declaration of war. They got that. They knew that. I mean, those, those British soldiers that they were forced to quarter, they're all still stationed right there in the colonies. They're not going to say, hey, guys, the colonials declared independence. Pour one out. They're not going to do that. <laughs> They've got brigades of redcoats all throughout these colonies. They're going to start shooting them for this. They know that. So, the, so that's why you itemize those grievances. They're pieces of evidence. Does the evidence justify the verdict? And since ultimately you are the supreme judge, God, you tell us if it does not. And if it does not, judge us instead of the king. This is foundational to understanding the law, the source of law, and the debate over the law in our postmodern progressive, really we're saying pagan society. What we practice nowadays is not that natural or revealed law that the founders described. That's what was intended. We practice nowadays a Frankenstein's monster that goes by many names, comes in many forms, and we can we can you know throw an elbow on here and and sew a kneecap there, and uh, it's it's just a, it's a it's a it's a mongoloid. 
For now, we will call it legal positivism, which is the idea that whatever human, this is key, human, 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 whatever human institution is seen as having the power to determine the law gets to make the law. Now, legal positivists, if some of you went to law school and you think that's what you are, you're screaming at me right now. That's not what we think. Well, a thing means what it actually does, right? A thing means what it actually does. Like we think Jesus is Lord. We just commemorated that last weekend because of what he did. He, he, he performed miracles. And then the ultimate miracle is he walked out of the tomb. If he had not done those things while claiming to be God, would we think he was God? No. No. That's why the whole evidence of Christianity is hinging upon that singular piece of evidence more than any other. Right? Yes. That, that, that's, that's the piece of evidence. It's not what someone claims or something claims. It's what it does. That's what it actually means. This is what it actually does. In other words, this is just pure humanism. Anything that a human being says is law becomes law. There's, there's nothing higher or more esteemed to hold it accountable to. Might makes right. Plurality, I got the votes. The golden rule, he who has the gold gets to make all the rules. This is complete contradiction to the legal schema that inspired the very founding of the country. Your laws, everyone's laws ever, have to be based on something or derived or sourced from, as I said about organic law. There's every country, every culture, every nation ever has had an organic law. It's just a debate of what is it and where does it come from? Ultimately, there are really only two options. Within those options, there's room for lots of disagreement. Okay, and theories and isms. But when you, if you were to do the, the taxonomy of it, the classifying of it, right? If you've ever done taxonomy, you know, genus, phylum, there's different, the, the, the classifications break down as we get closer to the specific species, but it starts here up here with a genus, at the, the very top, right? Okay, so up here at the top, there's only two. And then within those two, things get classified, discussed, and debated. But there's only two. Okay, uh, those only two options are humanism or paganism. And then the various debates that occur within that genus or the laws of nature and nature's God revelation and the laws that occur within that one. For example, if you're in the dusty Deaver camp, you think that, you know, we ought to go back to blasphemy laws. If maybe you've got more, if, if, you, if you want, the, if you understand that we need revealed law to be the basis for our law, but you're suspicious of government power, you're more libertarian, you're like, are those things that we want government to be prosecuting? We want to give them that power. Meaning they're debating each other, but it's into the framework. They all agree what the law is. They're debating to what extent we should go to, to actually execute our belief system. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But really, those are the only two forms of law, of sources of law. Those are the only, not forms, correct me, I'm, I'm corrected. Sources. Those are the only two sources. It's either going to come from us or it's going to come from him. That's it. That's all there is. There isn't any more. Not surprisingly, humanistic or pagan theory leads to humanistic pagan conclusions. Many of which, sadly, have permeated the American right. And you saw that a lot the last 36 hours. Pagans throughout the ages loved them some child sacrifice. Every pagan culture and every culture at some point in time has gone or been pagan. So this is another way of saying every culture has practiced child sacrifice. And every single time they made it, quote unquote, legal. Is there anything in the revealed law that says you can kill children? No. 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 Unfortunately, many people who are claiming that they want their laws based on revelation are helping them just the same to make it, quote unquote, legal. For example, federalism was adopted to allow states to def to, de to wasn't adopted to allow states to defy the natural law. It wasn't, hey, the federal government's got to abide by the natural law, but the states can go and do whatever the hell they want. No. Federalism was created so that the states could uphold the natural law and even allow them to defy the federal government when it decided it didn't want to do so. You don't ever have a right ever, ever, ever. Abraham Lincoln, no one has a right to do that which God says is wrong. You never have a right to do that which God says is wrong. God, in, in, in giving you a free will, may permit you to make choices. But do not take the permission to make choices as a right. 
hey, I think I've got a right to sniff your kid's hair whenever I want. No, I don't. It's not a right. Apparently the President of the United States thinks otherwise. Since our rights come from God in the founding vision of the country, then logically, who also gets to determine what is and isn't a right? Him. If God is the source of our rights, then who would be the source of defining what our rights actually are? And aren't. Yeah. God. That, that exact same God. Yes. Yeah. Can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. Many on the American right want to have it both ways. And, and, it, and this is, what I'm defining to you is one of the major reasons why we have lost more than cowardice, tactics. We've lost the plot of our own stated worldview. And so we have no plumb line at all. That's how we became the great tarp that I talked about on the show yesterday. There's no stakes in the ground at all. God said that um, you don't have a right to commit murder. See the Ten Commandments that we put a portrait of right there in the Supreme Court when we created that building. Why do we do that? So the Supreme Court could be reminded what the highest source of the law is that they're adjudicating. Hence, we made laws that aligned with his. That's why we have murder wrong, because he said murder was bad. So the original question to wrestle with here is, as it pertains to abortion, it's whether or not it is murder. If it is, then any government that permits to exist, that God permits to exist on this mortal coil, has a moral obligation to uphold the laws of nature and nature's God against it. And the only debate should be, how far should government go? Should we prosecute women who have abortions? See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. how, how far should the government go should be the only debate. Not a debate over whether we should permit it or not. It should be how far to go to, 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 to judge it or not to prosecute it or not. For much of the last 50 years, what has the quote-unquote pro-life movement been debating? How far to go to prosecute it or how much to permit it? How much to permit it. And because it's had like no debate over how far to go to prosecute it, it's all been how much to permit it. Have we stopped abortion by discussing how much to permit it? No. Do you stop anything on earth ever by discussing how much to permit it or how much to prosecute it, do you think? That strikes me as impossible logically and yes. in practice. That what you incentivize, you get more of. That what you disincentivize, Correct. you get less of. Correct. From there, can you argue what is the most efficient means of doing this? Proper jurisdictional application. Do we have local, state, and federal jurisdictions to prosecute murder currently, depending on the situation? Yes, we do. But these are all arguments that are to be debated from the premise of the best way to uphold the laws of nature and nature's God, which clearly state, thou shall not murder. Not to actually grant any human or human body the right to murder you don't have. No one can vote themselves a right to violate God's rights. That's not real. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. God's not like... Snap! They voted. Guess I'm done here. No. Wrong. By the way, at the first Easter, you guys remember? They held a vote. Will of the people, as I recall. Did they not? Pontius Pilate, the procurator, meaning the man, the lawgiver, the chief executive, or the law enforcement, I should say, the chief executive, stands up and he offers the people whom do you want? The king of the Jews or Barabbas, the zealot. They had a vote, right? Yeah. And the people voted. The will of the people, right? They did. What did the people vote? Barabbas. Kill the, kill the innocent man. We want Barabbas. Huh. There is no right to murder under the will of the people or any other such pagan or humanistic drivel. Uh, that is many things. Uh, me, uh, none of them are federalism or constitutional for both the doctrine of federalism and the document known as the, quant the Constitution are quantifications of how the laws of nature and nature's God are to be enforced and play out in our society. Federalism isn't the basis of something. Constitution, the Constitution isn't the basis of anything. They're quantifications of the organic law, which is the actual basis or source. Do you understand what I'm saying? This microphone isn't the basis for anything. 
It is the quantification or the clarification or the vehicle or instrument by which the basis of this show, the three of us and the, and the blaze communicate those things to you. They are meant to uphold that natural law, not desecrate it, as any government-sanctioned murder would do and does. If you are using the Constitution to commit or even permit egregious violation of the laws of nature and nature's God, you are not acting in accordance with it. You're in violation of it. For humans have no power or authority to violate the laws of nature and nature's God. I guess we don't know what inalienable means either. It means preexistent before us. That's what it means. Means we're here before we got here, here after we gone. So if something was here before we got here, here after we gone, how much power do we have to amend it? None! Why don't you go ahead, jump out of a plane and scream, I'm here to amend the law of gravity on your way down. I'm sure it'll hear your petition. We are not gods, even when we claim and act otherwise. You can couch it in whatever clever language or nuance you want. You can even dress it in the flag and call it populism. But evil is still evil, and a lie is still a lie. Whether it's Robespierre or whether it is Marie Antoinette. Whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. And when we do such things as we are now, they are agree- there are egregious consequences. The generations that founded the country, they were sinners too. Some of them thought that they could make chattel slavery constitutional. Their sinfulness eventually plunged the country into a civil war and ongoing racial divisiveness and now idolatry that we're still wrestling with today. Along those same lines, on the authority of God's law and our own history, uh, God will punish our generation's wickedness for this baby killing as well. I could even make the case the current laments that we see everywhere societally, economically, are confirmation of this truth. We don't have to ask a holy God to judge the rectitude of our actions. It's in his nature to do so. And what we really ought to be wrestling with here is not how much evil to permit, but indeed trembling for our country when we reflect that God is just and his, his justice cannot sleep forever. That's the actual intent and meaning of federalism. Now, that doesn't mean there cannot be complicated situations and realities that we have to confront in the real tangible world. So when we come back, I want you guys to present some and some questions and let's reason through them. All right. We'll do that here in a moment. Constitution Wealth is the Patriot's Choice in Wealth Management. If you are somebody, and I know there's an increasing number of you that are looking to go out of your way to not do businesses or to do business with businesses that are going out of their way to end your way of life, why not apply the same thing to your portfolio, to your retirement? Uh, They can help you do that at Constitution Wealth. Put your money uh, where your worldview is and line up uh, being profitable with being prophetic at the same time. They can reduce your investments in ESG, DEI, and all kinds of other woke schemes. Uh, And this is a great opportunity to help build the parallel economy together by working with an investment firm composed of professionals who are patriots just like you. So if you want to work with an advisor who shares your values and why work with anybody else, uh, you can have uh, so, so that you can if you or if you have 250K in stock or more. If that's your investment to portfolio basis, they're looking for you. And they'd like to help you reduce your exposure to woke companies. Just go to constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. That's constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. Once again, go to constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. All right. Now, I have laid out the schema. This is what the founders meant. This is what the law is, where it comes from, where it was meant to be sourced and derived. But now we're dealing with very real world problems and applications and e pluribus unum unum and what do you do, you know, and and there's going to be different uh, interpretations and ideas of what exactly that means, right? So now I turn it over to you guys. How do we integrate this 
in the real into the real world, what would it look like? Because the founding generations of the country faced this very thing themselves. Well, I think first we need to start where you ended. His justice cannot sleep forever. So we got to ask ourselves, is it still sleeping? Or has it awakened with a vengeance? Because we move forward has everything to do with that. And as it applies to yesterday's conversation, which this has grown directly out of, on the life issue, and what I think we were trying to get at, I know I was trying to get at, is how we move forward. If it's still sleeping, that means this capital is somehow worth dealing with on some level. The pro- the, the, the bells and whistles, the machinery of federalism is still an applicable process towards meeting out right and wrong, not just shirts and skins. Mm-hmm. Or... This isn't Washington, D.C., federal capital of America anymore. It's actually the capital from a Hunger Games, and we're all living in various districts. Because the discussion that we just had does not apply to that capital. They don't care. Correct. And that's what we have to decide. And in our comfort, and in our, we're going to celebrate July 4th probably, and we're going to do the traditions and we're going to have the fireworks and we have as you say and i can't say it with the same brilliant accent the accoutrements but is that hunger games or is it still america this is the basis for why a lot of the people i've interacted with are okay with what trump said yesterday and if this is your basis for why you're okay with it I'm okay with your basis because of the real world reality that you just articulated. Okay. The problem though, is that is not the basis that Trump articulated. He said, follow your heart. That's exactly no less than five times. Yes. That's Donald Trump never said, let's be real here. I mean, nobody knows how far gone Washington is than me. I went under, went a three week coup, a three year coup attempt. They stole an election from me. OK, I mean, the yeah, the, I, the idea that you're going to get <clears throat> you're going to get people who want to endlessly fund Ukraine. OK, uh, in order to, to save babies that that, that that aren't even born. Let's be real. Is that what he said? No. And I tell you right now, if he had said that, guys, I mean, I'd have a Donald Trump tramp stamp on my back right now. OK, right now, before I went into the show yesterday, I would have not go, I would have skipped leg day and gone to the tattoo parlor and said, put the orange man right over my right over my cheek that's what i would have told him finally now now we're getting some true disruption here we're dispensing some real raw truth here according to his reputation but that's not what he said he said he's reading from their playbook all the correct stuff, all the people that hate you are following their heart too yeah i mean we've all raised kids never once in my life did i ever tell my children because it's terrible advice. So if Follow your own heart. Correct. So if your basis for why on a policy level, what I just articulated needs to be fought out at the state level, given the state of Washington, D.C., I'm not here to argue with you. Okay? For example, on the worldview test that Aaron got 100% on that I did not. <laughs> all right? You want to know? I think I got like 85 or 86 because, dude, I'm the guy that created the... Uh, um, uh, after a fair trial meme that lots of people are emulating right now about, you know, public hangings of government and business officials, you know, okay. So I'm an enthusiastic supporter of capital punishment in the, on the grounds of where the Bible says it's the grounds for. But I got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm not overly eager. You overly eager to give Joe Biden more power to execute folks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you want to give a government that thinks uh, uh, praying in front of an abortion clinic means prison. It's not as if there's videos right now of the FBI knocking on everybody's door. Oh, wait. Yeah. So, so am I saying, therefore, that I've changed my stance on what is and isn't principally a capital offense? Did I change my stance on any of those things? No. What I'm saying is... I'm, I, I, I don't think you agree with my stance, and I'm not sure I want to grant you that kind of power to then use against me. And that's where we get into. We're, now, we're still in that realm that the law is based on revelation, but we're debating that with one another. Like, I hope later this year we're going to do an, a long-form evergreen episode with Dusty Deaver. That's our plan. He just doesn't know it yet, but we're discussing it amongst ourselves. 
one of the things that I'm going to question him a lot in that conversation, are we sure we want the government doing the? I agree with you. Are we sure we want the government doing this stuff? Because I think their definition of blasphemy is a lot different than mine. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm the blasphemer. That's a healthy debate. That's, that's the direction of the debate we want to have. Because we're debating how far to go to prosecute the laws of nature and nature's God. Now, how much we should permit violations of it. That's what Trump said yesterday. So if you're like, I think that we're better off fighting this off at the state level, given the state of Washington, D.C., I, I don't necessarily disagree with you on that. But that's, that's, that's not what Donald Trump said yesterday. What Donald Trump said yesterday was, follow your heart. Well, the heart is wicked above all things. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I just told you every human civilization has practiced some form of state sanctioned child sacrifice. Following your heart is a pretty damnable doctrine. That's what the former president said yesterday. He didn't articulate the realities of a difficult, complicated situation of trying to uphold these meta, these meta notions while down here, the whole damn thing's just breaking apart uh, on a molecular level. That's a complicated conversation that would take conferences and tomes to figure that out. OK, and, and, and we might be better off doing that, starting in places like Oklahoma, mm. Iowa and Florida and build out from conventions there. conventions of states, perhaps. Yeah. But that's not the argument the president right. made yesterday. For example, an hour ago, the Arizona State Supreme Court just ruled that the 19th century law, original law banning abortion, except in the rare case of the life of the mother in the state of Arizona, now with the overturning of Roe is in effect and enforceable. That's great news. But do you guys really believe the U.S. Senate nominee and, and the Republican U.S. Senate nominee, Carrie Lake, is going to agree with that based on what she said about abortion here recently? Because I don't. I guess follow your heart unless it's uh, we follow our heart until, well, you know, that's that, that I can't win the suburbs of Phoenix with that. So don't follow your heart anymore. Follow follow this heart instead. That's not a standard. What we're debating here is the best way to apply a standard. What Trump proposed yesterday was not having one. And those are two different things. Aaron, before I go to you, let's uh, make sure we also mention our friends over at Relief Factor. All right. If you are struggling with chronic pain, that's from too much inflammation in the body. All right. This is where Relief Factor comes in. It's not a panacea. I'm not guaranteeing you results. But over the years, about uh, over a million people have taken this. And 70% of the time that they've tried this three-week quick start for just 20 bucks, they've seen such great results. They've stuck around long-term with the product. What is the product? It's a supplement. It's drug-free. It was created by physicians who can prescribe drugs, but they got tired of prescribing drugs that masked symptoms and created other uh, side effects. So they thought, what if we could come up with a supplement that actually dealt with the, uh, the, the cause here, not just the symptom, but the real cause, the inflammation in the joints? That's what Relief Factor seeks to do. May not work for you. Pretty good chance, though, that it will. Why not give it a shot for 20 bucks and see if you don't see a difference in your pain in three weeks or less when you go to relieffactor.com. Again, head over to relieffactor.com. Todd, did I answer your question sufficiently one way or the other? Well, in, in as much as you or anybody can at this time with any moving parts, but I, I absolutely think you pointed out a crucial point you made sure we understood a crucial impediment to not wasting energy in this because a lot of us can feel righteous and ultimately be spitting in the wind if we do not understand the dynamics that you accurately laid out. Mm -hmm. Aaron? So if I can sum up the first half hour uh, briefly, essentially what you articulated is the only functional or at least only long-term functional approach to government that we have seen uh, maybe ever in the history of planet Earth. The only long-term approach that, that functions as a government should. Essentially, God is God. We are not. We, can out, we cannot outrun God's law, no matter how much we try. Mm -hmm. Implementing that in the time of our founders, I'm not going to say it's easy. They fought a revolutionary war over this. But implementing a functional government such as that was not easy it was a little more simple, though, mm -hmm. when the water table of our culture and society back then was imbued 
with a sense of acknowledging the laws of nature and nature's God. Whether you are a hedonist like Benjamin Franklin, whether you owned slaves, you were still in the water table. You were doing maybe terrible things, sinning against God's law in terrible, inhumane ways, but you still acknowledged that God was God and right. we were not. Right. I think the, the point that you emphasized and then re-emphasized needs to be re-re-emphasized that the founders were not declaring that, the, that they were better than the king, just that they were obedient. So the question that you broached at the beginning of this segment is essentially this. How do you inculcate what you just articulated? The only proven functional long-term form of governance into a culture whose water table is imbued with paganism and in some corners, outright Satanism. How do you do that? And I would, this is, this is where I'm coming down on for at least the meantime. The policy, and I think, I think Joel Berry, I think at, the, at uh, Babylon B and Jeremy Boring at the Daily Wire, they articulated things that are somewhat similar to this or at least adjacent to this thought that I'll be trying to articulate. We will never at the federal level, I will never, I'll just speak for myself, I will never, ever, 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 ever compromise on the on the uh, on the position never ever ever are we ever going to get exactly what we want our position to be at the federal level or even at the state level but we're concentrating on the federal level right now in this culture and in this day and age I'm I'm talking about right now probably not when we're talking about the issue of baby killing probably absolutely not what we want however as we go state by state are there different states or at least different areas of different states that are more likely to agree with the sentiment that we are not better human beings than our lawmakers in Washington, D.C., but we are more obedient? Yes. Is that sentiment true in the state of Oklahoma? I would say probably yes. Is that sentiment true in uh, Texas's 21st congressional district where Chip Roy represents? Probably true. Is that true everywhere? No. So in that sense, I'm trying to articulate what what Trump said just in a different way, or at least what he should have say, said just in a different way. Our best chance in this particular moment at actually governing righteously according to the laws of nature and nature's God might happen at the state level. It's probably going to happen at the state level. Does that mean, however, that that is the most righteous thing Nationally, no, especially when we're talking about first things such as what is a human being? What is a life? This country, as long as the institution of baby killing is still here, it is blood on all of our hands, regardless of how righteous our laws may be in any given state. If, if that's very well said, if much of what was called federalism here the last 36 hours and the reason it's idolatrous is um, you defecated on the true definition of it just to justify supporting yes. the inaction of the politician that you want to support. That's idolatry. You, you've made Donald Trump into an object of worship. You are de redefining words, terms, the law, existence itself on the basis of what is politically convenient for you. And that's really no different than the state legislator who asked Riley Gaines in your in your opening montage, what's your evidence that men dominate in uh, biological men dominate women's sports other than all mm. of it? OK, all, other than all of it. So the premise matters here. The, the problem when you get stuck on populism and zeal and humanistic feelings is it's all about the outcome. The kingdom of God is far more concerned about your pro about your premise because he's sovereign. So the, he, the, he kind of does the outcome thing. He's kind of got that. Okay. He's much more concerned about your premise. If our premise is how far to go to prosecute something, 
We still may inevitably have to permit a certain amount of evil because what it would practically take to, to eradicate it would create an even greater evil because we can't create utopia, right? But, but, we're, but, but here's the thing. If we're, if, we're, if we're discussing the links of prosecution rather than permission, then we're never talking about, well, if we're permitting something, then eventually don't we have to affirm it? Don't we have to promote it if we're permitting it? Prior to Lawrence v. Texas, no one was in prison for sodomy in America. We weren't permitting it. We just weren't prosecuting it. Once we got, once Lawrence v. Texas said you have a right to sodomy, now we're permitting it. And notice now the entire language changed to we're going to promote that which we permit. If we permit, we promote. If we're discussing how far to prosecute, doesn't mean we will. We can't get everything. No one wants an all powerful government capable of prosecuting every evil because then it's capable of taking away everything you have. Right. But but at, at, at that juncture, then, if just because we're not prosecuting something doesn't mean we're going to promote it the same. Right. Yes. That's a very key distinction. Your premise, how far to prosecute and whether we're going to permit it. Whenever you talk about how much to permit, you will always end up promoting every time. Every time. Romans 828.